Welcome to episode number three of the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. Steve and I's goal for this podcast is that we would become better backcountry hunters and that we could share that same information that helps us improve with you so that you can improve. Tonight's episode aligns perfectly with that goal. We dive deep on the topic of mule deer scouting. Our guest is Jason Wright. He has a ton of great information to share about selecting an area, scouting an area, and using optics to your advantage. So come join us in this discussion with Jason Wright. Well, Jason Wright, welcome to the Hunt Backcountry Podcast. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good to be here. Good. And we got Steve on the line as well. What's up, Steve? Uh, not much, man. Just uh, looking forward to picking Jason's brain a little bit. Yeah, let's do it. Let's <laughs> dive right in. So Jason uh, is is a muley slayer, even if you want to admit it. He has some great deer and uh, I'm sure some knowledge to share with us. So let's set the stage a little bit. Last week, we actually uh, talked with Lenny a little bit about some mule deer uh, scouting, um, things like that, just in terms of terrain. Um, but let's just kind of start from square one, Jason. If you were, uh, you know, midsummer, um, prior to actually getting boots on the ground, you know, when you're evaluating an area or a unit, where do you start? What things are you looking for from mule deer? Oh, uh, well, I guess, first of all, I would hope by midsummer you have it narrowed down to a type of area you're going to, going to hunt. Uh, like as we speak, I have Google earth pulled up and I'm, got a couple thumbtacks I'm looking at real closely for a, a high country scouting trip um, this weekend. So, but I, I would, I would think you'd have an area kind of pinned down as far as, are you going to go hunt some remote desert stuff or high country stuff? And, you know, from, from there, um, for me, it's, it's Google earth and, and, um, uh, uh, like Idaho trails.gov or whatever website shows the roads and shows the access points. And, uh, I actually had a little series of small circles that I knew what the mileages were for each one of them. Like an inch diameter circle was a three mile, um, a three mile area with no roads. And I put those circles on there and try to figure out areas where there's very limited access and then, and then turn to Google earth and start looking in real close and, and looking for specific things that look bucky to me. And, yeah. uh, that's kind of that's kind of the start of it all. So um, your primary thing is is looking for areas that are roadless, limited access. That's well, yeah, and um, or if it's an area that doesn't have uh, a general rifle hunt or something where the deer have a chance to get old is the main thing. And you know, genetics in that area is is I mean, if you're it also depends on if you're trophy hunting or if you're just looking for a good quality experience. Uh, I know guys that won't won't step foot in an area if there's not 190 potential you know if they know they're going to go there and they're only going to find 170 bucks they're like yeah I'll, I'll look somewhere else but for for me i mean i'm 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 a trophy hunter but i i also want just a good experience so um if there's a ton of 170 bucks i'm i'm, I'm down you know i'm not going to pass it up because there's not this amazing trophy potential mm -hmm. but um yeah kind of lost my train of thought there um yeah. So when you're looking in those areas, you're drawing those, um, you know, areas where you can kind of get in away from pressure. Hopefully you're looking at Google Earth. Do you look at, I mean, especially with like elk, people will say, oh, we'll get in Google Earth. You have to know the needs of the animal. It's like food, water, cover. Do you go through that? Is food, water, cover something in your mind for mule deer as well? Um, if so, or if not, you also mentioned areas that look bucky. Can you describe that? What do you What are you trying to pull apart there? Well, definitely food, water, cover. Uh, sometimes on Google Earth, it's hard to tell what what vegetation you're looking at. I've looked at some yeah. places that they look nice and green. You're like, oh, that's going to be good. And then you get there and it's uh, you're like, what was I looking at? Because this looks desolate and horrible. So yeah. as far as, as Bucky, I'm, I'm looking for windy ridges with bedding areas, uh, a little bench where they can um, perch up on that's wind wind to me is huge me and steve were talking about this a while back like is there a common denominator for a good high country deer spot and for me i think a lot of times it's these windy midday bedding areas uh where i mean sure there's there's feet all around the high country is always lush um and there's usually water in idaho 
water everywhere. Um, but the thing that is the most that makes a good spot in, in a lot of these places is well, if they have a good spot to bed where they're they feel secure and they have cover and wind in their face, keeping the mosquitoes off them. That's it seems to be huge. It's not the the only thing, but it's in most of the, my favorite spots, that's pretty key. Yeah. Do you think wind has to do in addition with the bugs, which is uh, you know definitely legit? Do you think that has to do with that security factor that they can have that wind and rely on their nose? Um, yeah, you you'd think it would, but I mean, most of the time these are midday bedding spots, and the thermals are are coming uphill, and they're always a lot of times, or, or most of the time, they're bedded facing downhill. So yeah, they got their eyes and their nose in that direction. They're completely vulnerable from the top. So it's maybe they think they're secure, but we're going to creep down on top and put an arrow in them if we can, yeah, you know, that's, where their weakness is. That's typically how you see those good hunts play out. That's for sure. That's, that's how it all plays out in our heads every time. Whether or not it actually happens is <laughs> <laughs> the great variable. Yeah. But, so I guess back to what you were originally saying, uh, what am I looking for in these areas? Yeah. Roadless is, is, is key for just, just hoping that you can get an older age class deer. There's a lot of places in uh, Idaho that are just horribly overhunted, and you know if you get a four year old deer, um, that's that's an old buck. And and there's other places that are a little more off off the radar that you might get a five, six, seven year old deer. And that's to me that's what you're you're looking for. Um, like there's a buck that is on uh, that that wide one that that you were stalking from below, Steve. That uh, the arrow deflected and. Like that—that that was an old deer. He wasn't right. g- genetically amazing, but he was thirty inches wide, and you knew—I mean, he had massive body, and he's mature and old and fun to hunt. And that's, you know, to say you took out this this awesome old buck that's eluded dozens of other hunters. That's that's kind of what we're all after. I mean, if he scores great, awesome. But if not, you know, it's still hell of an accomplishment. Yeah. So if you're looking at something like uh, hunt statistics in terms of number of hunters and things like that, you'd be willing to give up um, a success rate if it means that there's less pressure. Meaning, you know, a lot of guys, especially I guess if they're new, they're going to look at a success rate as maybe the most important factor in an area or in a unit. Um, But you would tend to prioritize uh, less pressure, even if it means that, you know, fewer guys bring something home. Yeah, I would say so. I mean... You know, that that old adage that ten percent of the people kill the majority of the critters with a bow, and I I'd like to hope I'd fall into that class someday. I don't think I do now, but uh, you can look at those, especially if we're talking archery. Look at those success rates and go, well, yeah. I mean, a lot of people aren't successful when we're talking about archery tackle, but it doesn't mean the, the animals aren't there, yeah. and you don't have opportunity. So I don't know if I'd look at the success rate. Um, I think I'd rather know what the the population densities are. Uh, mm-hmm. They don't seem. I mean, like buck to doe ratios would be great to know. Yeah, um, I'd I'd put more weight on on that than than success rates. Yeah. What okay. was that? The buck rate for the Wyoming hunt last year wasn't like forty to one or forty to one hundred, something like that. Yeah, no, I I don't remember. Um, based on what we saw, I mean, man, yeah, there, there's a pile of bucks there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Compared to ours at like twelve or fifteen, yeah, it's, ours it's crazy. is pretty rough. I, th- yeah. I think it, the most popular unit in I- in Idaho, as far as hunter density, is uh, unit thirty nine, and I think the their objective is twelve, uh, twelve to a hundred. And wow. one year it hit set, one year it hit seventeen. So they opened up a bunch of doe tags and a bunch of let's well, just kill them all. Well, you know, there's there's too many. Let's get it back to miserable numbers again. Wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold off on my rant there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole nother issue, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I wish I remembered off the top of my head what Wyoming yeah. was. but I thought I was thinking it was up there around 40. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty Pretty wild. impressive. There's one just one day hike where I had every intention of, of camping that night, but I couldn't find water, so I had to come back down to the bottom. But I saw 82 bucks in one day, and that just doesn't happen in a lot of places and, and that's just counting every deer and I had to like recount my steps, but, or every buck I should say. And that's just impressive. Um, that number of bucks and it was probably a 10 mile area, but still yeah, amazing population. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's, 
you know, you're picking out areas in Google Earth based on um, all the factors we discussed. So, you know, one thing I'm personally curious about and that we got some questions about is how you then transition. So, you know, we've defined, you know, say we're going high country uh, in a certain area of Idaho, uh, maybe even picked out some some basins that we want to check out. How do you approach that? Meaning, if you're going into scout, do you kind of use the same sort of precautions that you do when you're hunting? Are you looking at, you know, approach and thermals and, and not getting so wetted and busted? Or are you approaching from such a distance that those factors aren't as important? Um, well, I I love glassing from a distance. But in the summertime, the I mean, and maybe I'm spooking away every giant deer and I never know it, but the deer or the bucks are so docile that I – I don't really get concerned about uh, if I spook a buck out of an area that he'll never be there again. So I, I don't approach approach it with a lot of caution. I, I mean, I still um, try not to go walk above a bedding area with the thermals going down and blow everything out. Sure. Although that can sometimes be a good tactic for figuring out what's in the yeah. area. <laughs> <laughs> See if anything moves, right? Yeah, I found numerous bucks just uh, accidentally blowing them out and going, oh, hey, wouldn't have known he was there because he was bedded in the thick timber. So, uh, but you know, as far as getting into that area, I'm just looking for glassing points. That's, that's my main thing is that, you know, you can let your eyes do the walking for you and, and cover so much more ground at, at the, at the right time of day by just finding the best glassing point in the area. And, you know, nothing worse than getting up to a spot and realizing it's, you have a terrible vantage point and then you're, you're just humping it up to another peak, trying to get to another place to glass in that peak morning time when, when, uh, you should be behind your glass. Here you are, you know, stomping up a hill. Yeah. So that's my number one priority transitioning from Google earth to actual boots on the ground is having a game plan for the day. And, and sometimes I'll even go as far as on Google earth, there's a little, um, sunrise sunset feature. Mm -hmm. Um, you can turn that on and see where the sun's going to come up and just kind of double check because it, you know, changes seasonal in the winter. The sun comes up in a different spot on the horizon than in the fall. Yeah. You can um, play with the it, shadows pretty much, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, if, 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 if you have to be glassing east, which, you know, sometimes isn't ideal, you just want to make sure you're not glassing right into the sun, just stuff like that. Just kind of double check that your glassing point is going to be money mm -hmm. or, if there's little pockets of timber on the edge of the glassing point where you might get up to that and you just see a wall of trees, make sure there's a clearing below it where you can maybe hike down 40 yards and be able to see the direction you wanted to see without obstruction, you know. So narrowing down the glassing point and having a plan for glassing for the day is 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 pretty big for me. So Yeah, it, I was going to just add to that, like scouting with Jason, there's – I mean, he just takes it to a whole nother level of, of looking like he's he's actually looking on Google Earth and methodically picking out like, OK, I'm going to spend maybe on this peak at freaking 6 a.m. when the sun comes up. And by 830, we're going to move over to this one because the shadows are going to change and then we're going to be glassing into those shadows. And, you know, me, that that just doesn't even come register in my head. But that's, you know, Jason takes that to a whole nother level. Yeah, that's actually was what I was just getting ready to talk about was, um, you know not all days are the same, but what's a typical day look like? How much are you moving? Um, what, how are your strategies changing in, in terms of where you're trying to locate deer as you're glassing on, you know, if you have a whole day of scouting, what's that look like? Well, of course it's, it depends on the, the area you're, you're scouting and how the ridge, how the ridges lay out. But, um, one of my favorite things to do is, uh, move north during the day, you know, glass for the morning until the deer obviously bed for the day. And sometimes they'll, you know, depending on, you know, the moon, they might, they might bed really early and be bedded at daylight. And then, you know, they're going to get up uh, a little bit later and kind of feed around once again before they finally bed, bed permanently for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And even then they'll get up and stretch and, you know, reposition and bed back down. But so usually glassing from, you know, daylight till, nine to 10, mm -hmm. you know, late morning, I, I guess I'd call it. And then, then I'll start looking at moving and I, I love going north on a ridge and glassing into shadows. So, you know, when the sun's directly overhead and you got these on the north side of the tree is where the shadow is, you know, I want to be, I want to be looking east or west. Like, so if I can find a ridge that runs north, south, 
and I can glass off east west into the, like I'm looking into the shadows versus having trees block in the shadows. I want to be able to look into each one of them, mm. and that's a great way to find those not only find midday bucks but find where they go midday. Right, because a lot of times you'll have one basin that you're scouring uh, all morning, and you just ha- you're just picking it apart all morning long, and you might completely miss what happened in the basin behind you because you just you weren't able to be in two places at once. So next step would be to go start picking apart the bedding areas in that spot and maybe see deer that you wouldn't have, that you didn't see that morning. Yeah. So at, you know after the midday stuff, you know it's. It's tough to glass all day, so you might completely relocate and go somewhere for the evening. Kind of sure. depends on you know the area. Yeah. So, and the, I know we could probably spend an entire podcast on you know glassing strategy and techniques, but in general, um, you're sitting behind the glass. Like, what's your strategy in terms of are you using um, like a solid grid and working back and forth? Are you sort of sort of spot picking to glass into areas that look good? What's your strategy if you're, you know, on a pretty ideal vantage point and trying to cover, say, you know, the opposite side of a basin? Um, I don't really have a set in stone strategy that I stick to. Um, I think David Long was, had like a three-step glassing system. I I can't remember from his book years ago, but where it was a methodical thing where you glass with your binos and then you, um, then you pick out the intermediate stuff with your spot and scope and then 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 you really start gridding the hillside with your spot and scope and zooming in and looking in the shadows looking for a tip of an antler or an ear flicker i don't have a i don't i tr- i've tried to do stuff like that and i just end up being more random and yeah. the first thing i do in the morning is is obviously binos you're you're catching deer on the move and you don't need to be nestled in behind your spot and scope quite yet. Sometimes I'll tripod up the the binos just for a steady, you know, if you have that distance, like if you're looking at a distant hillside and it's just outside the reach of your, uh, your binos to where you can really pick it apart. You, and then you tripod up those binoculars. It just adds some range to where uh, it steadies it up. And you can now look at that hillside much closer than you could before when you're just off your knees or whatever. Yeah. So what power? The, what power are you typically running on those binos? Uh, ten power. Right. I used to be a twelve power guy, but they're just you have to rest them on your knees and a little shaky. So I'm yeah. ten by forty two uh, vortex right now. I, I kind of wish I had the ten by fifties, just a little bit more light, mm-hmm. and they're not that much bulkier. But yeah, ten power is pretty solid for for big open country glassing. Sure. So. And Steve, I mean, do you have a set plan as how how you glass? Or are you just No, yeah, I'm about as random as it gets. I mean, I think you do a better job. I mean, you definitely always spot more deer when we're glassing together. Um You just let them though, Steve, right? You're just yeah, like, Yeah, just, he'll pick out the good ones. I'm just lazy. <laughs> I just sit there and drink my coffee and wait for Jason to tell me, Oh, there's a buck. <laughs> Where's it at, Jason? How do I get there? <laughs> Will you see that rock? Go down. Uh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Okay. That's like a story that's played over and over. Oh, yeah, I'll look at Steven like, how how can you be drinking coffee and eating food right now? It's it's the time to glass. Like, it'll be like 9 o'clock. I'm like, I should eat some food. Damn, I don't eat yeah. anything. You can't keep them from in, the man. coffee, man. Yeah. <laughs> can't do it. Uh, I, I just I just pick, if I'm looking at Hillside, and the first thing in the morning, I'm picking the most obvious spots of, you know, I, I'll definitely just scan the the big openings first. And it's it's kind of a progression of at least in my head at first thing in the morning, I'm, I'm looking big. And then as the day progresses on, it becomes to spotting scope of, uh, and micro, you know, of picking apart every little piece of shade. And it, it actually blows me away how many animals you'll spot midday when you're really trying to, you know, when you're looking, you know, like Jason said, if you get on a ridge and you're, you know, you're looking into the shadows instead of to the tree or the shadows on the other side of the tree, you'll start spotting deer. And it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. When you, when you guys I are doing to, that, sorry, go ahead. I was say, I used to just be like a morning evening glasser guy until till I started hunting with Jason and learning really how to use the shadows and take advantage of it and, and find those bucks bedded. You see, you know, we see a lot of deer midday uh, where you kind of in your head you're thinking, you know, you're you're prime glassing times morning and evening, which which is still the case, but it's definitely uh, you know we're glassing when we're scouting, we're glassing all day long. We don't really take a break. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm curious about that. I mean, when you're when you're doing that midday glassing, um, you know, not just looking at the open areas, not just looking for, you know, buck on the feet movement, but you're talking about in the shadows or bedded is do you guys find that most of the time, um, or at least, you know, some of the time significantly that you're finding deer by picking up those little twitches, those little pieces of antler, or are you actually, you know, getting in the shadows and, and seeing larger sections of deer? Like if if you were to tell somebody what to look for in those shadows you know what are you looking to pick up for me it's um ears and antlers i mean they're constantly flicking their ears all day and it's not that you're necessarily going to catch that movement a lot of times i'm looking for you know the silhouette of antlers in the shadows like you just see that structure of a four-point mainframe or Mm -hmm. uh, i'm I'm usually looking for antlers Uh, occasionally you'll see a a white nose but that's more that's not scouting, you know, that's more when you're hunting them, when they turn fall colors in the summertime, they don't have that prominent white muzzle. But yeah, so for me, it's mainly horns, uh, occasional ear flicker, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, I catch movement. Let's say it's like, I'm terrible at glassing in some respects because I, I have too, bit, too much of a, I like try to look at too much at once. Instead well, of you're all hopped up on you're all hopped up on coffee too, <laughs> yeah. though. So, <laughs> that backcountry coffee drinkers alliance, man, we're yeah. starting this. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I do catch movement really well, so I'll, I'll oftentimes like be looking at something and and catch a flicker off the corner of the spawning scope and go back to it. And sure, sure enough, sometimes that's a deer. So, yeah. Well, that's cool. it really taught me how to glass in the shadows was uh, early on. I can't remember if I was bow hunting at this time. I don't think I was. But I'd kind of got the high country mule deer bug, and and I was actually in a buddy of mine's spot. He had drew a tag, and he's like, "Well, here's this great spot. You can, you can hunt it if you want. I'd rather have someone hunting there and and um, you know tell me what's going on if anyone's in there, if there are any bucks." And so it was one of those deals where the opening day was on a Monday, so I had the whole weekend to scout, and I found this just a nice um, five or he was five on both sides, just had an extra on the back fork on both sides, and. Nothing special, 24-inch buck, but I would have been just tickled to get him. And it, it was a rifle hunt, and I, I found him in the morning, and I just sat there on that peak all day long, did not move a muscle, just watched him all day. And uh, I was trying to study him and see what his daily routine, thinking, you know, I was treating him like I was bow hunting him when really I'm just, I have a rifle, and it should have been pretty easy. But yeah. I wanted to know what, what time in the morning he went to his bed if and then if he got up and went to water midday I, I just wanted to know his every move and I was amazed how difficult it was to keep tabs on him throughout the day he'd go in a little pocket of brush and I'd be like okay well I know he's there and so I'd kind of glass and look around elsewhere and then I'd go back and try to find him and he'd got up and moved while I wasn't looking and he'd be like 30 yards away in another shadow and it was just to me it, it really and, and the more I picked apart that hillside there's like four other bucks on the hillside I didn't even know about because I was so focused on him. But since I was forced to sit there and just pound that hillside all day, I was like, man, I need to, I need to spend more time just nestled in behind the spot and scope. And it was a, it was like a wind river, you know, $300 spot and scope. And I still just had my eye buried in it all day long. Hmm. And that I learned a lot that I never did end up getting that deer. He gave me the slip, um, opening day, but I still learned a lot about how to glass and how to how to keep tabs on something all day long. Yeah. So this is that that brings up a really good point. This is getting into hunting technique, um, but it, it's definitely related. You know, I I would imagine that as much scouting as you do, as much time as you spend behind the glass, and like you said, it's a skill you develop. Do you? use those same qualities um when you spot a buck during hunting season that you want to go after so like how much are you picking apart his surroundings and his areas to look for other deer that might you know blow the stalk for you um to look at um approach routes and things of that nature so how much does that glassing technique pay off when when season opens for you and how do you use it uh well I mean, I guess, uh, you know, if you spot a buck during hunting season that you want to hunt, and let's say it's first thing in the morning, yeah, you're studying the whole time uh, how many bucks are with him. You know, we always look for the stupid two points because they seem to be the ones that they always bust you or they always, yeah. yeah, they bet out in some stupid opening and you're like, what are you doing, you know? But, yeah, you know, you always try to plan your stock and 
Um, I think I pay attention more to the the bucks than I than I do landmarks, and I really should be like. Sometimes I'll like, oh, I'll just get to that tree, and he'll be right below it, and then you get over there, and it looks completely different. Yeah, um, we've all done that, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think you know you're just making notes that whole morning, trying to uh, plan your stock for when they finally do make their their afternoon bed and and you know become vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Good deal. So, I mean, this has been such good information for you guys who are interested in muley hunting. And Jason, despite what you say, I mean, you've you've got a lot to cover on the topic and, and some excellent, <laughs> excellent experience to back it up. But what would you say is like one weakness you have right now as a hunter? Um, and then what are you doing to improve upon that? Ooh. Um, right now it's kind of... Uh... A little bit of uh, nerves, I guess, is probably my biggest weakness is the anxiety a little bit. Uh, I've been struggling with target panic and uh, not shooting my best. I used to be, uh, when I first started um, hunting and hanging out with Steve and got my first Elite, an 80-pound Z28, I was I was, uh, you know, confident out to 80 and just had this almost this arrogance of my shooting ability. And here lately it's, you know, I probably wouldn't shoot past 60 or i know i wouldn't shoot i'd probably 50 is probably my effective range and and uh, i wish you know so shooting stuff mixed with uh it just when you have a, a team effort and you're trying to film a hunt and you're the shooter and there's definitely I, I get a little bit of i get a little rattled sometimes and on that the pressure of you know you get one chance at it and when that buck stands up after waiting all day and you got to make sure that you know everyone in the group is is counting on you to run an arrow through both lungs and make it happen. So mm-hmm. I, that, that's probably my, my biggest thing is, um, getting anxious, getting a little rattled. I mean, I've killed three deer with the, or three bucks with a bow that I've missed on the first shot, you know, just flew an arrow right over top of them and then got a second shot and just laced them all. So yeah. I think it's just nerves for me. That's probably my biggest thing I need to overcome. Yeah. So what, is there anything, I mean, Obviously, nerves is something somewhat intangible, but what are you trying to, how are you trying to change that? Is it, I mean, I think that one thing I've, I've, because I've, in different ways, I've experienced the same thing. And one thing that helped me is sort of kooky as it sounds is like just visualizing it. Like almost like you got to see it happen um, to be confident that you know it's going to happen to then sort of take that anxiety away about what if this doesn't happen? What if I blow it? So, you know, is it something like visualization? I mean, with the shooting, is it just putting more arrows down range? Is it a change in equipment? Um, when it comes to the target target panic, how are you handling that? Um, well, I'm trying to shoot as much as I can. I've been uh, um, using the back tension. Just that definitely helps for me. The more I can use that and just hold pin on the dot and just slowly, you know, rock it back until it goes off, that definitely helps with my... Uh, you know, punching the trigger and getting a little jumpy. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, other than that, um, I need to just get that kind of uh, arrogance back in, sh- in my shooting ability. I used to love to go to the Boise range, and I'd, I'd see people watching me shoot and going, I could hear them going, look, look where that guy's hitting, you know, stacking a bunch of arrows in the in the orange dot down at 60 and, and just feeling like, you know, cocky about it. I didn't need, I just need to get that back, and however that – happens I, i'm not sure you need the swagger man <laughs> bring back the swagger yeah maybe bust out the 80 pound z and start shooting that again <laughs> <laughs> cool what other topics do you have any other questions steve um go ahead you got to do it what do you got jason oh i was gonna say well you guys uh let's talk about weaknesses you're throwing it on me let's uh let's hear some of your guys is uh what's what's something uh a weakness that you want to improve on or am I putting you on the spot? Well, Mark, you're up. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, I'm, you know, I, there's not one, there's a, a handful at least, you know, I'm obviously in the stage where I'm just gaining experience as much as possible. Um, you know, you can talk about things all day and, and read about things and, and get good information just like we have tonight. But until you begin to apply it and then, uh, capitalize on it, I mean, it's a weakness. It's, it's information, but it's not you know, firsthand knowledge. So, um, certainly if it were to come to, to mule deer hunting, since 
I've never done it. There, there'd be a ton of weaknesses and I'd be <laughs> blowing things left and right, but that's part of the fun. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. but yeah, for me, I mean, coming, coming from the Midwest and, and heading out West each year, I mean, every year it's just trying to soak up as much experience as possible. Cause you know, that's, that's how you really learn. And I, I feel like I've done fairly well at doing that. Um, but I mean, that's my weakness and that's, that's what I'm, I just, love to get out there and, and to learn firsthand. Yeah. I imagine that's kind of tough, uh, where you're at getting any mule deer hunting in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, Mark. No, that was good. Yeah. Steve's dodging us. Yeah. I'm dodging. <laughs> no, um, hands down. Mine was, and I still fight it. It was patience of, um, just just patience plain and simple just not wanting to go 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 and and realizing that you know just slowing down and, and letting things materialize in front of you um you know that that's that's been my biggest struggle and, and i'm just kind of a naturally a little add personality just always doing something so it's it's hard i like i actually enjoy elk hunting more but you know the last uh I don't know, five, six years we've got into high country bucks. It's it's harder for me to hunt bucks. And I actually don't enjoy that as much during the process, but it's kind of afterwards I look back that I really enjoy the hunt. Um, and it's it's that, that mule deer is such that chess game of, you know, you move, you're, you're, you're the first to move because you're going to get to a glassing point. And then it's the buck's move of he's going to do what he does and all you can do is sit there and watch, which is like painful for me because I want to just, figure out how to go kill that deer right then and there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, you know, that was my weaknesses early on as a bow hunter was I would have tried, you know, I would have see, seen that deer. And for some reason I had it in my head that deer moved like miles and miles and miles. And, and during a migration hunt they do. But in that early season, those bucks aren't going to leave those basins. You know, you're going to find them. If we scout them in July, I'd say 75, 80% of the time again, we'll find them August 30th come opening day. Um, yeah they're not going far. So it was having that realization that the, there's not this hurry. I don't have to go kill that buck right then. And, and just being patient and, and waiting, um, waiting it out, you know, waiting for that's, you know, probably one of Jason's greatest strengths from outside looking in is, I mean, he'll park his ass on a peak. That's a good glassing thing for, for days on end. You know, I mean, if he's, especially if he's got a big buck located, he'll just sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait. And, you know, I'm going stir crazy. So, yeah yeah it's definitely my yeah definitely my biggest weakness was it was patience and, and i'm i fight it constantly it's not something that um that it comes naturally to me yeah yeah it seems like you know obviously with elk you can try and make something happen you can move you can call you can do all kinds of things but with mule deer it's sometimes you have to let that mule deer give you the opportunity and you can't like sometimes there's nothing you can do like you have to put in the time you have to wait for him to make a move, to make a mistake, to shift positions. Um, so yeah, I, I would see that patience would be, would be exceptionally, um, important with mule deer hunting. And that, yeah, that's exactly right. That, uh, Lenny was the one that, I mean, as far as pointing that out and going, Hey, I'm just going to get close and let the deer make the mistake. And, and that's mm-hmm. just such a get, good game plan. If it's pretty easy to get within a hundred yards of a group of bedded bucks, if you have the right cover and terrain to get there. But, um, and then if you can just sit there and wait, if you have the patience to, you know, sit four or five hours until they decide to get up and feed, then, you know, let them make the mistake and game over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's huge. That's something I, when I first started bow hunting, I mean, waiting 30 minutes for something to happen would have been unheard of. And I mean, I, I can think of uh, big red last year in Wyoming. I mean, Jason, and I got down in there. At, what, what, what time did we get down? Probably 11 noon, something like that. The thermals had switched pretty quick. Yeah. And was, then, when yeah. that, then he finally got up and um, it was six thirty seven. I mean, yeah, we sat down there the majority of the day. It felt like. Yeah, I mean it was it was a good probably six hours of sitting in one freaking spot within a hundred yards of that buck waiting for something to happen and, wow. and an entire day, you know. And we, I mean, we got freaking close to making that happen. But yeah. So then, what what is that thing? I mean, obviously, if you know what's that, what's that go now factor? If you're within a hundred. 
Um, you're trying to be patient. How do you know when the moment's right? Is I mean, obviously, a lot of times it is. They're standing up, they're repositioning. But what other things are you looking for to um, to give you the green light and go and make a move? Is it usually just a positional thing? The deer's moving positions. Uh, I mean, you're obviously predicting or trying to predict what they're going to do once they get up out of their bed. And like in the big red example, we had seen another buck, um, big gray bed in the same exact spot the day before. And when he came out, he went straight side hill towards the, towards the spring. And so we, we were like, okay, he's in the same bed. He's probably going to do exactly what that older mature deer did. And he's going to come right to the same spring. So we just got ourselves right to where he was going to, we figured he was going to come. And we sat there for whatever it was, six hours. And there was, he was untouchable where he was at. There was a shale rock slide above him and scrub, little scrubby pine trees below him where we couldn't, we didn't even know for sure where he was at. And when he finally came out, he didn't do, obviously he didn't do what we uh, were hoping he'd, he'd do. He came out and went straight downstream, like downhill and away from us, which left me in like this little cat and mouse game of trying to stalk behind these giant boulders to get to close the gap down from from what 150 i, I can't even remember mm -hmm. 150 plus down to you know hopefully 50 or 60 and it just never i never could catch up to them yeah. so, so yeah. as far as that that zone it's just it's all situational um my 2011 buck i knew he was bedded and in, in this little cage of trees and i got down to 30 yards and thought well i'm definitely in range now um if he gets up he's he's done so yeah do you think sorry i was gonna add to that of just yeah it's 100 percent just that we're gonna get as close as we possibly can and in an ideal world you could shoot the buck right there in his bed you know you know if, if you got a clear shot for the lungs shoot him um but more often than not we're stalking from above and there's a tree above him and that happens all the time. And it's, it's, yeah, I remember sitting on a buck with Tyler probably 2013. We got just same as Jason's 11 buck where we, we sat above him for three hours and, and just because we could just see the tip of his antlers. And, you know, from there, there's, there's no move. Um, and that's one of the, it's really critical to make sure you go in, uh, you know, late afternoon or early afternoon once the thermals really switch that they're blowing uphill good. Cause if you, get in there if you you know oftentimes these bucks will we find they'll bed at like you know like jason was talking about earlier you know depending on the moon phase they'll bed about 9 10 and they're going to get up about 11 to noon and then rebed. um and sometimes you you might be able to get in there at that 9 to 10 time but more than likely the winds aren't going to be in your favor the thermals hadn't steadily switched yet and so we got to wait for that early afternoon bed um and uh just yeah, we just sit there and wait for something to happen. And you can't really, you know, if you push it, you're going to screw yourself. Yeah. So you guys typically, I mean, I know this obviously changes with fronts and, and other factors, but, um, you know, say early September, you're typically seeing those thermals at least consistently uh, come uphill for you at noon or after. I mean, what's a good sort of general guideline? Oh uh, man, some of the steeper country we're in, sometimes the sun, if it's a west slope, the sun doesn't even hit it till the afternoon and then it takes a little bit even then for the thermals to switch. So noon's probably safe. If it's a you know, it's an east facing slope, sometimes it's as early as like nine o'clock, the thermals will swap on you. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's it has everything to do with the sun and the sun heating up the hillside and then obviously that's how thermals work and Sure. Yeah, it's there's no hard and fast like one of the spot I used to elk hunt every day at 9:30, the thermals would switch. I mean, you could set your watch by it, but it's not always the same on the deer high country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah th that alludes to back to like scouting and stuff like that. I remember we, the the most ideal are like the south uh, south and east facing slopes for us because they, you know, that's when the thermals are going to switch early and they're going to be steady, um, you know, all afternoon. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have a good, you're going to have a good opportunity to get in there at that first bedding point. And then, and then anything that's kind of, you know, that's going to be North and or West facing, um, the good thing, you know, is you'll be able to hunt pretty late in the evening. The thermals probably won't start dropping down until, um, you know, pretty late. So it's always something to kind of keep in the back of your head. Yeah. And going back to scouting and, 
you know, the original topic, I guess, uh, that's something I'm, you know, because all the high country stuff that we look at, it's, it's like covered in what I call buck pasture. I mean, there's, there's feed everywhere and you're going to, you could see deer any spot around there. And so, so you're really looking for bedding areas and trying to figure out, okay, if they are here, you know, if they're on the east hillside, that hillside's going to get hit sun. The sun's going to hit it first and they're going to get hot and they're going to bump around to the west side and they're probably going to bed up there on the west side. And then in the afternoon it gets hot, they they might bump back over to the east side and get out of the sun. So, I mean, you really are trying to plan where you think they're going to call it an afternoon and and where you can stock the easiest. Uh, I, I love west slopes because not only do you have the thermals in the afternoon, but you got the prevailing wind too, usually coming west to east. So, I mean, it's pretty pretty safe to uh sit there even at 30 yards and never even worry about the wind because you got strong thermals and and a gusty prevailing wind mm-hmm. awesome well that's that's great information i feel like we've uh at least set up a good game plan on how to get uh into hunting season and you know obviously we touched on hunting tactics and there's a lot more we could cover but We'll save that for another episode. So, Jason, thank you so much for, you know, not only taking the time, but being willing to share this information with us. Yeah, no problem. I don't know how helpful it was, but uh, there's probably something in there, I guess. Oh, there's <laughs> there's some gold. There's some gold. <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a good night. Hey, you too. It was fun, guys. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. All right. Thank you for listening to the Hot Back Country Podcast.